Last night, I had a dream. There was a girl. I got this kind of gift. I can see people, places. So I'll see you again. I know where to find me. But they're not just dreams. They really happened. What did you see? A girl murdered. I think everyone at some point in their life has wished they lived in another era, another time. Nostalgia is such a, a very tricky thing. And I think sometimes nostalgia masquerades as like homesickness and everything like that as well. And I think it's just such a, a universal feeling. I think everyone's had it. Um, and to be able to build a story around a young girl that feels like that and who is so willing herself to be transported back and only thinks of the good stuff, like the amazing fashion, the great music, the swinging 60s, um, and then to turn that on its head and be like, hey, all that good stuff came with a hell of a lot of bad. It always feels to me in somewhere like Soho that you're only like sort of one wrong turn away from something really bad happening. And, um, and the later at night you get, the higher the chance that is of happening. And, you know, I, it's even like in the first stream, you go into like the most glamorous swinging club in London. But that doesn't mean that everybody who's there are who they say they are. That is very deliberate in terms of like we, as Eloise starts to look forward to the idea of going back, then things start to become more unpredictable. And now like the, her dream essentially is like, she's obsessed with the 60s, she goes to London and through her kind of like psychic gift, she gets to go back to that time. But then there's a point where she doesn't want to go back, but she can't stop the past coming to her. Even much like Ellie in the film, I feel like places soak up memories. They soak up experiences. I don't necessarily believe in ghosts, but I do believe in this idea of like sound and experiences and lives sucked into walls and street corners. Uh, and I could never walk around anywhere, but especially not Soho without thinking, what happened here? Or what, what have these walls seen? Who's drank in this bar? Who's died in this room? Miss Collins? Yes. It's Ellie. We spoke on the phone. Oh, yes. Room is on the top floor. Have a few rules. Don't take smokers. I don't smoke. No male visitors after eight o'clock. That's a problem. And no using the laundry room at night. It rattles right through to mine. I don't do laundry. I? I mean, I don't do nighttime laundry. I do do laundry. I'm very clean. Good. It's a bit old-fashioned for some, but I won't do nothing to it. If you don't like it, you can find somewhere else. It's perfect. I love it. You're seeing the movie through Eloise, played by Thomas Mackenzie's eyes, so you're going on a journey with her. And all of the movies that I've made, the main character is in every single scene. Like, I haven't really made any movies where it kind of cuts to, like, another plot. And, and this is no exception. And in a, in a strange way, I think it's even more like subjective in a sense that you're going on this journey with her and at a certain point are like her, you're like a voyeur of like the sort of the other plot line. When she goes back into the 60s, she sort of like is, you know, kind of almost like body swapping with Annie Taylor-Joy, but also remains there as an observer. And then I guess the nightmare of the film is what if you could go back, but you were powerless to change the future? Because I've seen something like Back to the Future, Marty McFly goes back, but the changes that he makes in the 50s affects the 80s. In this movie, Thomasin sort of gets to go back to the 60s, but cannot do anything to avert disaster. And that to me is like the true nightmare, is that if you were there just as a witness, but you couldn't stop anything. So I think that essentially is what the movie is about, is like, are you thinking so much about the past because you're failing to deal with the present day? Jack, I don't want to do this. You think you can just walk away? But also meeting kind of like Sandy and starting to obsess about her then gives her confidence in the modern world. And she starts kind of acting in a more confident fashion like Sandy. She starts designing clothes that she's seen in the dream. And she eventually like changes her hair to look more like Sandy. So then there's an element where like she's being, you know, 
she's being influenced by visions that she's having in her sleep. Although they share a lot of similarities and they're on a similar journey, they're both very different people. You know, Sandy, I think, is more vulnerable, but holds it in a way and, and masks her vulnerability and is trying to project this dream image of who she's wanting to become. So she's always trying to push herself forward. Um, and in a way, even though they're both two women after their dreams, Sandy's kind of journey is much more harrowing because she can't reach out for help. And that's doubled a lot in, in Ellie. You know, she, she won't reach out for help when she should, but eventually she does. And there's a vulnerability with her character as well, but it's so open, it's so worn. It's just, it's, it's just this very obvious vulnerability. And that to me was the core difference between the two, is Sandy's hiding everything and Ellie can't. She doesn't know how. The bartender said I should get to know the handsome fella standing next to Silla Black. You should. And you are? The next Silla Black. Sometimes there's those sequences where, like, for the most part, as a writer-director, you're trying to get what's in your head onto the screen. And then sometimes, and this is the best thing, is that with amazing collaborators, is you've done something that exceeds what was in your head. And I've had that happen a couple of times on most of the films, and, and always in working with amazing people that sort of like bring other things to the table that I hadn't thought of, or just kind of taking what my idea of it is and taking it further. One of the really wonderful things about co-writing with the director is that you get unlimited access to that. Um, and a lot of our, you know, especially when we got into like the second and third draft, a lot of it was spent refining the script to match his vision. Um, so like you, we would have the story down, we'd have the characters down and now it'd be like, no, we're going to move out of this scene quicker. He's got a vision for this cut. He's got an envision how these scenes are going to fit together. And so it was like tailoring the script to work with that so that then when that goes out to everyone on the set, it's a working document. I guess you're always sort of trying to push yourself to something which you don't know whether you can quite achieve it. And I guess, you know, Baby Driver had a number of those sequences. And, and this, again, is like you're, you're doing a high wire act because you're trying to do some things that are incredibly complicated, whether it's just like shooting on location in Soho or like shooting geographically correct chases or like in the first dream sequences doing these like long uninterrupted dance numbers with lots of transitions between actors. But yeah, sometimes it's that having that degree of difficulty where you go to work not knowing whether you've bitten off more than you can chew. And I guess, like, there's probably never a day that I've ever travelled to a film set without these butterflies in my stomach or that low-level anxiety of, like, you know, it's like sort of... I guess it's that imposter syndrome that keeps you on your toes. Is like, maybe today is the day where everything <laughs> fails and I get found out. Or it's like, no, you can't do this sequence. Like, it's impossible. What you're trying to pull off is, is insane and impossible. But in a weird way, that those kind of challenges that you set yourself or the kind of the high bars that you set for yourself and what's stopping you from being complacent, you know, the day that you go onto the set and kind of just kind of phone it in is the day to hang up the megaphone. Not that I ever use a megaphone. <laughs> 